Our text is taken from our second reading, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. It's read a few moments ago. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ, you don't have to go far to see walls of hostility that divide people. These walls are all around us. Israelis and Palestinians are constantly fighting with each other. We see fighting in Syria, Iraq, Iran. Even now our own country sees hostility at its worst through murders in Milwaukee, Chicago, and virtually every larger city. Whereas once we might have been immune to acts of hostility we call terrorism, now we, saw, we see terrorism on our own shore. Then there's the seemingly endless mudslinging between the two dominant political parties of our land. We even see walls of hostility in our own homes as husbands and wives travel down that path leading to divorce. Even kids, one minute they're giggling and laughing with, with each other, The next minute, they're at each other's throats. Walls of hostility. They're all around us, even in our text for today. The Christian church in the ancient city of Ephesus was made up of two distinct groups of people. On the one hand, there were the Jews, the circumcised, as they were referred to, And on the other hand, there were the non-Jews, the uncircumcised, also known as Gentiles. Now, the fact that these two groups of people formed one Christian congregation was, humanly speaking, quite amazing, since normally these two groups of people did not get along with each other. In fact, It's not too strong a term to say that they despised one another. But here they were, together, moving forward as one body in the name of Jesus Christ. God had led them to understand that the faith that they shared in Jesus was far greater than any individual differences and backgrounds. And as a united Christian congregation, they exhibited their love for their Savior by loving each other and by reaching out and sharing that message of Jesus Christ with other people. Now, in the opening words of our text, St. Paul, speaking specifically to those believers of the non-Jewish background, he writes, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, when you look at those words, you begin to see some interesting designations. When someone is a foreigner or an alien, It implies that they are not part of a particular people or culture. Spiritually speaking, that's what the Gentile Christians were. They were outside the household of God. But now, according to St. Paul, all of that has changed. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit, working through the preaching of the gospel and through holy baptism, the same baptism we witnessed happen right here to Henry, these Gentiles were brought to faith in Jesus. A faith which is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So there you have it. This is what the true Christian faith is constructed of. 
The foundation being the word of God spoken through the apostles and the prophets and the central message or the chief cornerstone of that foundational word is Jesus Christ. Let's unpack this thought for a bit. What is your Christian faith founded upon? As individuals, as members of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church, as a church synod, the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, is not our faith founded upon the Word of God? And perhaps we can go even a little further. Our faith is founded upon the verbally inspired Word of God. And we can still go further. The verbally inspired, inerrant Word of God. And still further. The verbally inspired, inerrant, and immutable, that is, unchanging Word of God. The true Christian faith, our faith, is founded upon the one true God and the one true God has spoken to us and has revealed himself to us through his word. How do we know that? St. Paul would later write to a young colleague named Timothy and he would tell him how all of scripture is God-breathed. That is, it is the word of God. God. Similarly, St. Peter would write and tell us in his second letter how God the Holy Spirit so carried along the writers of the Bible that what they wrote was not their own words, but these were the words of God. Scripture is full of references to this grand and glorious fact. The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, is the true inspired word of God. Now, sadly, today there are some well-meaning Christian Christians who have abandoned this foundational scriptural teaching. Yes, they may give reverence to the Bible as the word of God, but in the next breath, they say that its teachings were historically conditioned by the times. Or that the ancient man back then didn't know what modern man knows today. Were much more enlightened than they were back then. Or that much of what, the Bi what is in the Bible is simply does not apply to us anymore. They will talk about the Bible being inspiring but not inspired. In essence, what they're doing is sinning against the first commandment, setting themselves up as the true arbitrators of Scripture, all in the name of progressive Christianity. Well, you can call the sun the moon and the moon the sun, but that doesn't make it so. In the same way, regardless of the tampering and redefining of mere mortal men, the Bible remains the true word of God. And central to the Bible, as Paul points out in our text, is Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. And without him, without him, folks, we are in a heap of trouble. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The Bible, as well as everyday experience, tells us what we already knew, know through our powers of observation, and that being human beings are sinful. Let me personalize this a bit. We are sinful, and I'm including myself in this. I'm sinful just as much as all of us are sinful. God laid down his laws in the Ten Commandments, and he asks us not to break them. But we do. All of them. On a regular basis. 
We don't give him the glory that he deserves. We often misuse his name. We don't take his word as seriously as we should. We argue. We fight. We gen and we generally try to order the world around our own personal selfish desires. And the world, the world talks about these things in terms of being character flaws or personal weaknesses. But God in the Bible has another name for this. It's called sin. And he says the wages of sin is death. Eternal death. In a very real place called hell. So what does this mean? Well, it means that on our own, we have no hope. More than that, on our own, we are a condemned people. So what's the solution? What's the solution to our problem? Jesus Christ is the solution. He became one of us and kept those commandments perfectly as our substitute. Then he suffered the punishment that we deserve because of our sin. Then three days later, he rose as a testimony that everything he said and everything he did was acceptable payment on our behalf. And everything Christ did, his perfect life and righteousness, his sacrificial atonement on the cross to take away the sins of the world is transferred to the account of those who look to him in faith as the Savior he is. This means, on account of Jesus Christ, when we die, we will not be condemned but we will be received into Christ's heavenly kingdom. This, my friends, is the message of justification by faith. The teaching that we are saved through faith alone in the work of Jesus Christ alone. This teaching, justification by faith, is, in the words of the Lutheran reformers of the 16th century, the doctrine on upon which the church stands or falls. It is, and it must, remain the central teaching of our faith. But there's more, my friends. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is not only important at the time of death, but it is just as important to life in the present. The same Savior who loves us to the point that he was willing to die for us also tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. This same Savior who suffered the bitter pains on our behalf tells us that he will see us through whatever pains may come in this life. The same Savior who went the lonely way of the cross is always there to pick us up when we fall. The bottom line is this. Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Savior, the substitute uh, sacrifice for all of our sins, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, is the cornerstone of the Scriptures. And He is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. You see, those two things, the scriptures and our Christian faith, they go hand in hand. The word of God is the foundation. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Consequently, if you lose the word of God as the foundation of truth, you will inevitably lose Jesus Christ as your cornerstone. Sadly, many throughout Christianity are following this path. 
A recent book written by Michael Horton warns the church about following such a path. The book is called Christless Christianity. In it, Horton argues that major segments of the Christian church in America are setting aside their central teachings of Jesus Christ in favor of an alternative gospel, which really is no good news. So what can we, as members of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Janesville, Wisconsin, do? What can be our response to all of these divisions and these, the attacks on God's word? Well, the first thing we can do is thank God that by grace alone he has led us to believe, to understand, and to find solace and comfort in the truth of God's word and in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Second, we can stand firm in the truth of God's word, even in the face of the persecution that will inevitably come, calling those who have strayed to repentance and faith. And finally, we can ask God that the precious message of true Christianity founded upon God's word with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, will find its way into the hearts and the lives of more and more people, even as God in his grace has allowed it to enter into our lives. Brothers and sisters, there are walls of hostility all around us, but God through Jesus Christ has made us one, despite our differences. He has unified us. Let us then live as one body, confessing Jesus Christ in this, in this divided world. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.